Uh, brilliant. Um, good morning. Good to see you looking awake, um, most of you. I don't know whether that means you've had a good night's sleep or a lot of coffee, and I'm not sure. Maybe a combination of both. Um, I, I, I actually kind of weirdly enjoyed sleeping on a bunk bed. Um, I haven't done that for years, but it did remind me. Um, uh, of, I, I, so I, I had a brother and a sister growing up. I was the eldest of the three, and uh, I remember when we got bunk beds in our bedroom for me and my brother to share. And uh, and of course, being the eldest, I got the top bunk, and he was really angry at, about that, uh, and kept saying, "Can I ever go on the top bunk?" No, 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 no. So I I was there on the top bunk, really enjoying it until one day he just been really angry, and um, then I, I came into the room and he was just silent there on his bottom bunk, and I was trying to chat to him, he just wasn't saying anything. Oh, this is a bit weird. So I got up onto the bunk and I I sort of got into bed. I lay myself down and I found that we had these like polystyrene ceiling tiles and my brother had got a pair of compasses and had gouged into the ceiling Liam is uh, and then something I won't repeat and so I got into bed and I lay down and I was like what? <laughs> like, and I was so angry and he just bolted it out of the room. So last night as I'm sitting there or lying there on my bed I sort of lay back and it all just came flooding back to me uh, and it made me chuckle actually. Um, I'm not sure my parents chuckled as <laughs> they had to replace the ceiling tiles, but there we go. Um, great. Anyway, uh, I hope that last night really set us up for what we're going to uh, think about as we go through this weekend. And actually, so many of the songs we're singing today, again, just about Jesus is worthy of all our devotion and praise. I mean, we sort of summed up in a couple of songs what I took a long time to say last night. Um, but I, I hope that that idea of giving ourselves wholeheartedly to Jesus, not in order to earn anything from him, but in complete response to what he has done for us. That's, that is going to permeate everything we talk about this weekend. And as I said, uh, and for those of you that weren't here last night, as I've been thinking about this weekend, and it's weird when you're asked to come and speak and do four talks at a weekend, you're like, I've got the whole Bible. Where, where do you go? We felt led to Romans 12. And I just had that word recommitment, which I just feel like this is part of what this weekend is about. It's about us recommitting ourselves first and foremost to God, but then knowing that devotion to God actually looks like devotion to one another. So it's about recommitting ourselves to one another as well, and also recommitting ourselves to the mission that he has got us on. And so last night we looked at Romans 12.1, Today we're going to add in verse 2. Uh, clearly we're not going to go at this pace all the way through the weekend. Um, we'll be here forever. But uh, in, in verse 1, Paul t- talks about this idea of presenting our bodies as living sacrifices. And here in verse 2, he starts talking about our minds. And actually these two verses, uh, they're not two separate things, because I think Paul sees our bodies and our minds as being connected uh, and actually unified around this um, idea of worship. And actually something I should have said last night Um, is in verse 1, it says, uh, in the NIV at least, it says that presenting our bodies is your your true act of proper worship. I think it's something like that is the phrase. In the ESV, it actually says this is your act of spiritual worship, um, which I think is actually a little misleading. It is accurate because the word, um, the Greek word is logikos. It does mean spiritual, but it also can mean rational. And I think when we think of spiritual, we can think of it being you know, disconnected from our bodies or somehow bypassing our minds. That's not what Paul means here. Actually, he tells us to bring our bodies, our physical bodies, uh, as a spiritual or kind of rational, logical uh, act of worship. And I think part of the reason is, in the light of all God's mercies, what's the logical thing to do is to bring every part of us to God. And it is spiritual, it is physical, it's all tied together. And I think Paul here ties together our bodies and our minds in this kind of spiritual, rational, logical physical act of worship. And I think the reason is because within the logic of Romans, uh, and we're going to tease this out in a moment, Paul sees there being a real deep connection between our worship and our thoughts and our lives. In the logic of Romans, uh, what we worship shapes how we think, which affects how we're able to live. And I want to show you this by going back to Romans 1. I might work you a little bit harder this morning, but um, then, but I hope you're up for that. Um, So Romans 1 is a very difficult chapter, and actually I'm not going to get into the most difficult stuff about it, really. Um, But let me try and summarise what I think the overall message is, as clearly as I can. The Bible says that we are made in the image of God. We find that on page 1 of the Bible. That is, we were made by him uh, to reflect something of his character and his nature. We were created in God's mould, as it were, in his pattern. And we were designed, ultimately, to find fulfilment, fullness, and wholeness, life to the full, in relationship with him, by a life conformed to his pattern, as it were. 
The fourth century church father Augustine put it like this in his famous prayer. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. I think that's a great summary of of really the Bible. (laughs) We were designed for relationship and rest with God, and we were designed to be conformed to his image. But Paul says that humanity suppressed the truth that we know deep down about God. So he says this, "Although although they, humanity, knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. According to Paul, at the very beginning of Romans, the heart of the human problem is to do with worship. It's to do with the fact that we have exchanged true worship to the living God in whose image we are meant to be conformed. We've exchanged that for worship of created things. We've worshipped created things rather than the creator. And actually, when we give, what we give our attention and worship to shapes us. So if we worship God, we get shaped more in his image. If we worship things of the world, we get shaped more in their image. Someone who expressed this brilliantly uh, is one of my favourite writers, a guy called David Foster Wallace. Um, If you've never read any of his books, I'm not sure I'd bother actually, I I love them, but they are thick and they're dense and um, uh, quite hard going. But this is part of what he gave actually in a speech at a university many years ago. He was a brilliant American uh, postmodern author. He struggled all his life with questions of faith um, and also struggled with depression and tragically took his own life in 2008. And it's, never, it's not clear, actually, if he ever came to any conclusions over his questions of faith. Um, but in a brilliant speech entitled This is Water, he says this, and it's a long quote, but bear with me. Um, actually, you could probably go and get a coffee and come back and I'd still be reading the quote. It's, it's that quote. But it's great. It's a brilliant depiction of what the world does to us. He says, in the day-to-day trenches of adult life, There is no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshipping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And an outstanding reason for choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power, you'll feel weak and afraid, and you uh, you will need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. The insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful, Paul would question that, and as would I. Uh, But he says this, this is the important point, it's that they're unconscious. They are default settings. They're the kind of worship you just gradually slip into day after day, getting more and more selective about what you see and how you measure value without ever being fully aware that that's what you're doing. And the world will not discourage you from operating on your default settings because the world of men and money and power hums along quite nicely on the fuel of fear and contempt and frustration and craving and the worship of self. Our own present culture has harnessed these forces in ways that have yielded extraordinary wealth and comfort and personal freedom, the freedom to be lords of our own tiny skull-sized kingdoms alone at the centre of all creation quite a dense thought, but I think it's actually really profound. He's saying all of us worship, not just Christians, not just people who consider themselves religious, all of us worship. Because worship is about what you give pride of place to, what you give most authority in your life. And the thing is that most people worship without even knowing what it is that they worship. But if it's fame, if it's glory, if it's appearance, if it's intellect, if it's money, whatever it is, those things shape us without us even realising them, because they lock us in so that we're constantly pursuing more. What we worship, what he calls the world, and actually what Paul calls the world, is this system that is shaping us. There's a battle for our attention, and what we worship shapes us more than we're even conscious of. So Paul says that when humanity gave pride of place to created things over the creator, the consequence was that we became less than we were meant to be. Think back to the Garden of Eden. The serpent says, oh, if you take this fruit, you'll become like God. They were already like God. They became less like God by following this voice. And that's what happens. When we worship anything other than God, we become less than what he created us to be. So Paul says, 
Just as they, again humanity, did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a worthless mind. Hold that phrase in your in, in your not so worthless mind. Uh, hold that in your mind. A worthless mind, so that they do what ought not to be done. That word translated worthless, it's the Greek word arokimos. I'll come back to that in a moment. It means to be unable to correctly assess truths about God, about the world, and about ourselves. And what Paul is saying is that as we began to worship things other than God, our thinking became worthless. We became less able to accurately understand God, understand the world, understand our place in it. And as a result, we become unable to live the life for the full that he created us for. If you were to ask Paul, why are we in a mess in our world today? Why do we experience so much fear or anxiety or um, the absence of peace or life-controlling habits? Why is there so much evil, wickedness in the world that humans inflict on one another? I think he would say it's because we have become enslaved to the world. That is, we have given pride of place in our hearts to something other than God, and it has changed our thinking. Misdirected worship leads to futile thinking. It's quite heavy. (laughs) But why did I start there? Well, back to Romans 12. This is what Paul says. And remember, in the logic of Romans, as we saw last night, 1 to 11 is this expression of the gospel that starts bleak, gets joyous and joyous and joyous. Chapter 12 is the application of all that has gone before. So it makes sense that in chapter 12 he would start where he started in Romans 1. So he says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, everything we've learned about the gospel, in light of all of that, offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to the Lord. This is your true and proper worship. Why does he begin with worship? Because that's where the problem all began. So he says, give yourself to God in worship. Because the way out of futile thinking is not ultimately just about training ourselves to think differently. It's about training ourselves to worship differently. The way out of futile thinking is not about changing your thinking, it's about changing the object of your worship. It's about putting God back at the center of your lives. So he says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Let's unpack that uh, and we'll get practical. So he says, do not be conformed to the pattern of the world. Now for Paul, like for David Foster Wallace, the world is not just stuff that's out there. It's actually, he sees it almost like this active force that is preaching at us, that is trying to get our attention and shape us. We are in a noisy world. There are so many external voices that are shouting for our attention all the time, whether that is uh, cultural norms and expectations, opinions of friends and family members, whether it's social media, whether it's advertising, whether it's literature, education, religion, uh, what we might call the spirit of the age, these kind of just cultural attitudes that particularly characterize our place in time. Actually, the the phrase that Paul says when he talks about being transformed to, uh, sorry, conformed to the pattern of the world, the word translated world is actually age. So I think that that phrase, the spirit of the age, is quite pertinent. There are so many voices that are trying to shape our attention. And when Paul says, don't be conformed to the pattern of the world, he's saying, don't allow those voices to shape and influence you. Now, to be clear, not every voice out there is bad, right? Right now, I am an external voice to you. (laughs) I am seeking to shape your thinking and the way you live. Hopefully for good, I guess that remains to be seen. (laughs) So not every voice is bad. But actually, when we put something other than God as pride of place in our lives, I think we often lose the ability to sift between the good and the bad. That's what Romans 1 is telling us. The world is preaching at us all the time. And the way the world preaches at us is not actually by going for our intellects, it's by going for our hearts. See, the world goes for our emotions. Because what we internalize, what we believe at a deep internal level, has a power to shape us perhaps even more than what we think up here. Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. The heart, in biblical terms, is like the the place where the whole emotional, spiritual, and intellectual life of the person sits. And what we believe there determines who we become. Which is why communicators and marketers, they don't actually often try and influence your mind, but your heart. They try and get at the level of your deep longings. Uh, Imagine if someone were trying to sell a product and they put up a billboard and it said, uh, come on, let's just be honest, 
I want you to buy my product. Um, let's just sort of stop beating around the bush. Just buy this thing. Give me your money. Get on with our lives. We can go our separate ways. <laughs> like you're not gonna. You're not going to buy that because you're going to be like, well, that's stupid. Like, what, what are you doing? What they do is they actually appeal to us at a heart level. They show us this thing and they subtly, silently sometimes go, don't you really want that? No, I'm, I'm not going to reason you into it. Don't you want that? And they appeal to us at a heart level such that we think, oh, I do want that. Actually, I really want that. Actually, my life isn't complete without that. <laughs> and so by getting to our internal lives, marketers know that they can connect with us at a deeper level. Because what we really long for in our hearts drives our thinking and therefore our actions. Which is why scripture says, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. So guard your heart well. What we internalize, what we allow to take pride of place in here shapes how we think and what we become. And I think that's what Paul is getting at here. And he says, give yourself to God in worship and don't be conformed to the pattern of the world. He is saying, if we go down the route of false worship, that leads us to a place where we are unable to reason properly and unable to live the life we were created for. The world promises enlightenment, but leads us into darkness. It promises life, but it leads us into death. False worship leads to futile thinking, which leads to wrong living. And it's worth noting, actually, that Paul, right here, is addressing believers, not unbelievers. Although Romans 1 is talking about something that's true to all humanity, here he's speaking to people who are already in Christ because he knows that that battle is not over when you become a Christian. Actually, there is still a battle going on where the world is trying to get our worship, trying to get our affection. So he says, do not be conformed to the pattern of the world, but there is hope. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to leave you in a place of misery. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul says that when we come back to God, when we give him pride of place in our hearts, when we worship him rightly, something changes. We cease to be conformed to the world and our minds are transformed to God. And he says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. And that word approve, it's the Greek word dokimatsu, which ties right back to Romans 1. Paul said in Romans 1.28, when we reject God, our minds become worthless when we put God back at the center, our minds become able to approve what is good once more. Paul is saying that true worship leads to the restoration of everything that is lost to our sin. Does that make sense? You see how that works in the logic of Romans. So Paul says true worship leads to renewed thinking, which gives us wisdom for holy living. Okay, that's quite dense, <laughs> but let me try and ground this. So, What does this actually mean? What does this mean for us? Well, I think the first thing is this. Well, it means we need to worship, and we've nailed that yesterday, uh, but we need to keep worshipping because there is a battle for worship going on. We need to constantly give God authority in our lives, and we need to firstly hear his voice. We need to hear God's voice. The way out of futile thinking is not just to change your thinking, but to change what you worship. We need to give God prime place in our life and authority to shape us more than any other voice. If we want to know how to live effectively, we need to hear God's voice over all the other voices that are competing for our attention. So my question is this, how frequently do you take time to hear God's voice? Of course, there are many ways of hearing God's voice. Primarily, I think it's through scriptures. He has given us this book that communicates his heart and his voice to us. How frequently do you take time in your week to allow God's voice to shape your thinking? How does that compare to the airtime you give other voices in your life? On my phone, I've got this um, rather terrifying thing where you can look at your app usage. And um, I nearly put a screen grab up here, but I was too embarrassed. Uh, and it tells you, like, over a week, what apps you use more than anything else. And sometimes it's shocking. Like, you look on it and you're like, I have no idea I spent so much time on that app. And sometimes I think it's just like I leave it open in the background. Um, well, I'm justifying myself here. But, like, <laughs> but... But it's just terrifying sometimes. You look at it, and for me, Bible app right down there. Now, I like to think it's because I use a paper version as well, and it can't record that. But like, imagine you could see that for the whole of your week, for the whole of your life. What are the voices that you hear and listen to most of all? I wonder where the Bible would rank in that. We live in a noisy world. With all these voices seeking to influence us 24-7, it's hard for the voice of God to cut through. 
And so if the only time in the week we give to hearing the voice of God is, say, 90 minutes on a Sunday, that means that then for 23 hours and... Well, sorry, so, so for six days, 22 hours and 30 minutes, my math is very bad, um, we allow other voices primary place in our lives. If the only time you try and hear God's voice is through the preaching of the word on a Sunday and singing songs and maybe listening to him and praying on a Sunday, that means the vast majority of your life you are giving space over to other voices to shape you. Of course, those other voices are unavoidable. But what I would say is if we up the amount that we allow God's voice to come into us on a daily basis, that's going to give us a good chance that we'll be better able to follow him. In so many ways, our culture preaches at us. You know, sometimes people say, oh, preaching's a dead art form. I'm like, tell that to the world, the flesh, and the devil. (laughs) Because they are. But the world is preaching at us all the time, trying to shape our opinions over what it looks like to be happy or fulfilled, where our value comes from, about the importance of self-expression. You do you. You About what true freedom looks like. Don't let anyone else tell you how to live. To be free, you need to be free from all rules. Follow your heart. Follow your urges. After all, we're physical beings. You only live once, so... You know, live it up. Like the world is preaching at us all the time. And if we come to church on a Sunday, having heard those sermons, and then we sit for 90 minutes, and that's the only time we start hearing how God thinks about us, how God thinks we can live and find life to the full, then one of two things is going to happen. Either the things that we sing about and the things we hear read to us are just going to bounce straight off, and we won't believe them at all. Or more likely, what will happen is that for those 90 minutes, we go, yes, amen, of course I agree with that. And then we go back into the world, and for another six days, 22 hours and 30 minutes, we hear sermons that are completely at odds with it, and we wonder why God's voice struggles to genuinely make a change in our lives. We need to be people who hear the voice of God. And so can I encourage you, and you may already be there, which is great, but can you cultivate a lifestyle of hearing God's voice through prioritizing his word? It's an act of worship. We need to be people who read the Bible regularly. And of course, the way you do that will look different from person to person. So I'm not going to prescribe you must do it this particular way. For all of us, we have different rhythms and routines, different parts of Scripture that are easier for us, different ways of engaging with it. Uh, You know, Many people like to start their day first thing in the morning, getting up and getting the Word of God into you before any other voice has another chance. For some of us, that simply doesn't work that way. And that's fine. There's nothing in the Bible where it says, thou shalt only read my word in the morning. Like, read it at lunchtime. Read it in the evening. Whenever, just get it into you. I'm having to adjust my rhythm at the moment as um, I I work two days a week in Swindon and I have to sort of drive, which is a a horrible drive. (laughs) And so, yeah, I want to hear God's voice on that drive because it's miserable otherwise. So so I'm driving there and and I'm having to get used to using the audio Bible, which I find a weird experience. I've never done that before. It's taking me a while to get used to. Uh, It is lovely because I have David Suchet reading to me, which is, (laughs) I wish he did it in the Poirot voice, but I I would probably (laughs) struggle to take it a bit more seriously. But like, I don't write. It still does me good. I can't write it down and take notes in the same way that I normally like to, but it still does me good. It's good to get the Word of God into you. However it works for you, find a way of listening to God's voice. You may find it helpful to read, follow a reading plan. You may want to do Bible in one year. Uh, that may just be too fast for you or too confusing for you. Whatever. I don't mind how you read the Bible. Just read the Bible. And actually, if you do want help on this, a uh, little plug, uh, Bible Society has a brilliant course called the Bible Course, which is a great way of helping you to understand the whole sweep of Scripture and how it works together. Sorry? Highly recommend. Highly recommend. Wonderful. I didn't even say that. That's great. <laughs> um, yeah, brilliant. Fantastic. I mean, other courses are available, I should say. Um, for example, the forthcoming Romans course from Bible Society. <laughs> uh, but, but like, this is a great thing to do together. And you know what? You don't have to read Scripture just by yourself. Read it with others. Actually, I think that's the primary way that it used to be read. I think we've made the personal quiet time a bit of a weird, isolated thing that it never was in previous times in history. Like, read the Bible together. Get God's word into you. But secondly, it's not enough just to hear God's voice. We need to believe God's voice. It is possible to read the Bible every day, to attend church, to pray, to know a whole load of information about God, to do theology degrees, if that's your thing, and still not truly believe the words that we know so well. We need to move beyond just hearing it to actually believing it deeply. In 1602, um, Spanish explorers sailed up the coast of California, and they returned with these journals of their voyage. 
And somewhere, <laughs> this is the worst bottle to drink, but it just splashes all over me. Um, somewhere along their journey, uh, they made a mistake in documenting their voyage. And so they came back and they drew these maps. And actually, if we can have a picture of the map. Um, this is what they believed about California. They drew it um, thinking that it was actually separate from the mainland. Now, I don't know how they made that mistake because they couldn't have sailed through this little bit. California is actually a peninsula collected, connected to the mainland. But this is how they drew the map of California. Uh, in the late 1600s, Jesuit missionaries sailed to the island of California, and they traveled around the island, um, or across the island rather, but when they got to the north, famine hit the island, so they decided we need to get back to the mainland. And so they got to the north, and they decided to head back to Mexico City, and to their surprise, they didn't have to cross any water. <laughs> Why? Because it's actually connected to the mainland. And the record of their journey was the first conclusive proof that California was not, in fact, an island, but part of mainland America. By the early 1700s, many others had made that journey, and they had conclusive proof that the maps were mistaken and that California was connected to mainland America and actually always had been. However, by this point, Californians like to think of themselves as being islanders. <laughs> because Why? Because there's something distinct about that. There's something different about it. It shaped their identity, the way they thought about themselves in relationship to the rest of America. It got into the way they thought about themselves. So what did they do? Well, they just didn't change the maps. They kept on making new maps like that. Why? Because even though they were confronted with this proof, they didn't like what that would mean for their identity. And they would rather believe a lie that reinforced the identity they enjoyed rather than face up to the truth. I think that demonstrates something about how easy it is to know something, have conclusive proof about it, but not actually believe or act upon it. Why? Because I'd rather stay as I was. We need to not only hear the word of God, we need to believe the word of God. When it comes to our faith, it is all too easy to understand things about him, understand things about how he sees us, but not actually live in the good of them. And if you read through Romans up to this point, you would have gone through chapters of glorious, glorious truths, some of which we've prayed out this morning and we've sung about, about how Jesus has utterly changed our lives. How he came to deal with the problems of sin, of guilt, of shame and death. He's dealt with them head on. How? By taking them all upon himself at the cross and extinguishing their power. By taking them to the grave and then rising again from the dead. So that if we are united with him, sin has no power over us. Our old self is dead in the grave with Jesus and we've been raised to newness of life. And Paul sings about, sings about this and writes about this and celebrates this, about the incredible changes that Jesus has made. We are no longer orphans. Rather, we are adopted as children into his family. We are given the Spirit of God, which transforms us. The Holy Spirit lives in every one of us. We have an inheritance. We have a new identity, a new future. Everything's changed. And you read that all the way through Romans, particularly, I guess, 4 to, to 8 and then up to 11. And you just think, amen, amen, amen. That is beautiful. And it's so easy to know that up here and not let it change you in here. And the tragedy is that we can know those things, we can sing the right songs, and yet still think of ourselves in a way that God doesn't think of us, as slaves, as orphans, as being powerless to change. There's a passage in the book of Exodus which I, I, find, I find frankly terrifying. <laughs> and it's in this moment where Moses is sent to proclaim freedom to the slaves. God's people are in Egypt. They've been living under this oppressive rule. God appears to Moses and sends him as a messenger to declare this. And this is his message. I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Imagine that. You're in slavery and you hear this message. That is the best news you could ever hear. Absolutely incredible. There is freedom. There is new identity. There is new hope. There is a new land. And what does it say? Verse 9. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. That is, they had been so oppressed, so crushed, 
so formed into thinking of themselves as slaves that even when the best news comes their way, they can't receive it. Isn't that tragic? Moses preaches the best news possible, and they hear it, but they can't receive it. I find that terrifying. And if you're anything like me, it's easy to read those Old Testament stories and think, well, I would have believed it, but would I have? Too often I read the good news of what Jesus has done for me, but I don't think I actually allow it to take root in my heart and change the way I think about myself and the way I live. It's too easy to hear the voice of God, but then that internal voice, shaped by the external voices of our world, that internal voice whispers, well, you know, those promises might be true for others, but they're not true for you. You could never be that. You will always be this. Oh, sure, it says that. You don't really mean it. God can never do that in your life. God can never use you in that way. You're too old to change. You've been doing this thing for too long. Just stay in your slavery. Isn't it terrifying how easy it is to hear the word of God and not live in the freedom that it intends to bring? Hebrews 4 compares us to the people of Moses' day. And it says this, Good news came to us, just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them. Why? It's not actually because of any deficiency of the message. It's because it did not meet with faith in the hearers. That is, it is possible to hear the best news. And yet, if we don't connect with that news by faith and draw it into our deepest being, the hearts, where what we think shapes who we become, if we don't respond in faith to what we read, then we merely hear it, and it doesn't actually produce any fruit in our life. We need to be people, if we're going to live in all the fullness and the life to the full that Jesus came to offer, we need to be people who hear God's word and then connect with it by faith and say, I am going to live as if that's true. I'm going to see myself, Lord, the way that your word says you see me. Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters. That is a strong word. He's not like, I highly recommend. (laughs) It's like, I urge you, because for Paul, this is a matter of life and death. Because there is so much life to the full available. And yet the world is constantly tugging us towards death. So he says, I urge you, I beg you, I plead with you. Give yourself to God in worship so that you won't be conformed to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And in so doing, then you will be able to think correctly and live the life to the full for which he designed you. So how do we do that? What does it look like to be transformed by the renewing of your mind? Well, let me just give you four steps. And these are four things that I go through myself. Whenever I face doubts or I read something in scripture uh, and I struggle, this is the way that I connect with it by faith. And there are times, actually, when I just find myself locked in things and I think, oh, I can't seem to break that habit or that way of thinking. This is the process that I go through. And so I commend it to you. And it's simple. And you probably do it already to some degree, but it's just good to remind ourselves. We need to firstly recognize the lie. When we encounter a lie, we need to recognize it for what it is. It might be a way of thinking that is contrary to the way that God sees us. It could be a promise that is made to us by the media or the world around us. Hey, if you live this way, you'll be most free. If you live this way, you'll be most satisfied. If you get this product, you'll be most fulfilled. When we encounter those lies, we firstly need to recognize them for what they are. And sometimes we recognize them immediately because they just jar with whatever we've been reading the word of God. Sometimes actually we don't recognize them until we've been living with them for a little while. (laughs) That's, I think, the nature of living in a fallen world. Often we find ourselves in these patterns, just getting immersed into sin or ways of thinking that are unhelpful. Sometimes it will be a few days before we even think, how did I get here? Oh. And in those moments, you can feel like you despair, because it's particularly if it's something that you've often fallen into in the past, you think, is there any hope for change? But once you recognize the lie, we need to reject the lie. Recognize it for what it is, and then simply say, I choose to reject that lie. I refuse to believe that thing about myself that is contrary to the word of God. And sometimes I do that out loud, probably not in public, <laughs> be a bit weird. Um, but when thoughts come into my mind and I think that is contrary to the word of God, I have to say, I recognize that that's a lie. And I choose not to give it authority over me. Because what I internalize has authority over me. 
That is, in a sense, what I worship. So I choose not to worship that. And I will say, lie, you are not the object of my worship. You have no authority over me. I am worshipping the true and living God, and I care more about what he says. Recognize the lie, reject the lie. Thirdly, replace it with truth. That is, remind yourself what the word of God says instead. And to do that, of course, you need to know what the word of God says. You need to carry it around with you. Actually, Andrew, we were talking earlier about you know how amazing it would be to have a, a book in your back pocket that's like what Jesus said about everything. <laughs> well, we kind of do, it's the Bible, but it's, like, it's a bit hard because there's so much in there, isn't there? Wouldn't it be great if you just had a personalised group of scriptures that you could just pull out and go, no, this is what the word says to my situation. Actually, we can do that. There are certain scriptures that really speak to traps that I know I often fall into, so I memorise those. I carry those ones around on my phone. Not that I haven't got the whole Bible on my phone, but I need those ones like weapons that I can wield at particular moments. We need to replace the lie with the truth. We can do that by reading verses over ourselves, singing songs packed with truth, filling our minds with truth. But then fourthly, we don't need to stop there. That's often where I think we stop. We just read the Bible verse and we move on. No, no, no. The fourth step is we need to receive it by faith. Remember what it says in Hebrews 4. You can hear the good news, but unless it's met with faith, a response of faith, it won't actually benefit you. So when we recognize the lie, we replace it with a verse from the Bible that tells us how God thinks. We then need to say, okay, and I connect with that. I draw that into my heart. I receive it by faith, and I choose to live as if it is true. I know it very often doesn't feel like we are dead to sin. (laughs) It feels like we're half a life still flapping around to sin, (laughs) or at least it does for me. It doesn't often feel like I'm a new creation. It doesn't often feel as if I'm as free as Jesus promises. But if Jesus Christ genuinely rose from the dead, and that is a fact of history, then what I can't do is go, well, sure, I'll just lower my expectations to the level of my experience. I need to say, no, no, if that is true, I'm going to trust his word. And I'm going to live as if it's true, even if I don't feel like it right now. Though right now, this feels too good to be true, to believe that I am a son of the living God, that I am dead to sin, that I am completely free, that sin has no power over me. Though right now, it doesn't feel like that. I choose to see myself, God, as you see me. I say, Holy Spirit, make that a reality in my life. And then I choose to live as if it is true. You might say, well, isn't that just the power of positive thinking? Yes, it is. But it's the power of biblical thinking. And it's positive because it's biblical. It's not just wishing things, it's saying, I'm going to choose to live as if it is true. And the thing is that as we do that, as we connect it by faith, it becomes true. We are able to walk in greater freedom. I wondered if, um, we're going to come and we're going to do something, an exercise in a moment, but I'd love to just invite Helen actually to come and give us a worked example of this, uh, just to see, kind of, to kind of ground it in reality. Um, shall I wave my microphone in your direction? Do you just want to talk? Or, oh, you have your own one. Oh, no, then I have no power to. Uh, <laughs> okay, this, this shows trust in our marriage. Um, do you want me to ask you questions or do you just want to talk? Okay, great. So um, I've asked Helen to just share an example of someone that she met pastorally with. Of course, this is anonymous. We're not going to tell you any details about it. So um, this is well thought through, don't worry. Um, but g- can you give us an example of a particular person who you worked through this kind of process with? And how did it start? Yeah, so um, a friend of mine actually came to me and said, um, you know, could we meet and talk because she'd been really struggling with something. And we sat and talked and she really felt like um, she had been lying about really silly little things. And she kept being caught in these lies. And she wanted, she she recognised that that was like a real problem Mm -hmm. and she wanted to deal with it and she couldn't work out why she was behaving in the way that she was. Mm. So that's how it started. Great. So she recognised an action that mm. was not great. And then as you went through the process, did she sort of discover why she was thinking that way? What was the lie that made her think that she should then in turn act that way? Yeah, so that, that was the first thing we did really, was we, we sat down and we talked together. And, and through me asking her questions, we talked around, why is this behaviour coming out? What is it that, about yourself that you're believing that you... That makes you act in this way and it, and it turned out that it was all about sort of self-image and self-esteem and how she saw herself she was feeling um like she wasn't good enough or um she needed to add in bits about herself in order to make herself seem better mm, great i mean that's a powerful realization isn't it and sometimes we don't know why we do the things we do actually as david foster wallace said the insidious thing is their default settings and we find ourselves doing them without realising, but stopping and recognising, why am I doing that? What's the lie behind that is important. 
I said, did you end there? Or <laughs> how yeah, did you go on beyond that? We just said goodbye and that was it. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we obviously spent some time praying together. One of the first things that um, I encouraged her to do was actually to confess that to God and to spend a bit of time just, you know, acknowledging the, the parts of herself where she recognized she was wrong. And, um, and then we began to look at the Bible together and we identified several places that um, gave her some of these tools, some of these verses that she could hold on to that where she could replace the lie of I'm not good enough or I'm, I'm like this before God with actually I'm like this before God and, and I believe this about who I am mm, in him. Mm. Um, and so we made a list of those things and she took them away with her and um, I basically just encouraged her to spend some time every day just reading through that list and to try to memorize bits of it and that when there were temptations that came into her mind during the day or, or she could I think one of the things that she really acknowledged was that actually she could she began to recognize when the lie was creeping in mm. and I think that's that was one of the really powerful moments when we met back again together um, was that she recognized that she had a choice to spot that lie coming and then to replace it with mm. something from scripture Great. Um, and so that, that's what she did. She went away and Great. she did that. And so how did that affect then the way that she lived? Um, well, honestly, she she really didn't struggle again <laughs> like with that particular issue. Mm-mm. Like It was amazing. We met up again. I think we met like four times in total around this specific issue. And... Um, after we t- sort of she'd taken away the the, the verses and, and begun to sort of work through that, whenever we met up again, she'd say, "Yes, I've been doing it," and "No, I haven't been tempted to lie. I haven't 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 done it again." Um, and that was amazing to me. I just was so grateful to God because hmm. it feels like a really silly thing, doesn't it, to to just change one thought or one sentence for another sentence, mm-hmm. but actually. It was really powerful for her, and yeah. it improved her relationships yeah. with other people because they yeah. felt she was being authentically her in yeah. the way that she was interacting, and they could trust that she was being authentically her because there were, weren't these silly little things that were popping up of like mm. that doesn't match up with what you said before kind of thing. And yeah. so, it really it, it really impacted some of her significant relationships, yeah. which was brilliant. Fantastic, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, and I get Helen to share that part because uh, she is a pastoral ninja she's amazing at these things and and way better than I am and I but I think that's a really great grounded way of thinking about these things and um and I could tell you many stories from my own life about how I've had to replace lies with truth and and do on an ongoing basis and sometimes it changes like that um more often it's about the battle it's about on an ongoing basis saying I will not be conformed to the pattern of the world uh, but I want to be continuously, consistently, repeatedly transformed by the renewing of my mind. And so here's what I want us to do. I want us to lead, I want to lead us in just a simple exercise of speaking words from the Bible over ourselves. Um, I I don't know everyone in this room. Uh, I don't know what you're comfortable with. Um, So I hope that no one will feel uncomfortable with this. Of course, do do it to whatever degree you feel comfortable with. And um, But I'm simply going to read some Bible verses and ask you to say something that is true over yourself. Um, And uh, and then we'll come back and we will worship. Um, And we're not going to make this a big and dramatic thing. We're simply going to speak truth and choose to believe it. And some of it you'll be like, yeah, I know that. And I'm living in the good of it. And some of those things you'll actually find it quite hard to say about yourself. And you'll think, oh, I know that's in the Bible. I know that's true of the person next to me, but maybe not me. And if, if that is true, I want you to notice those things. And um, we don't have to do a lot with it right now, but just notice the things that you actually find quite hard to believe about yourself from what we're about to say. And then actually, as the day goes on, we'll have opportunities maybe to talk with someone that you trust. We don't have to do things in this room, but we may have an opportunity to pray about them as well. Uh, And of course, we'll come back to worship. In the next session, Helen's actually going to speak to us and it'll be a little bit different, um, a different sort of theme, but we'll have plenty of time there to worship more and maybe to pray for one another. But simply right now, I want us to engage in the discipline of hearing God's word to us and agreeing with it. Um, so if, I mean, feel free, 
I would invite you to stand because I think that's kind of helpful. But of course, if you'd rather sit, kneel, whatever, like go for it. I find it helpful to stand just as a way of making sure that I am engaged. Uh, and actually, maybe band, if you want to come back up, and um, yeah, let's let's stand or get into whatever posture helps you. Just to say, God, right now, I'm I'm making an active choice not to be a a passive uh, viewer of what's going on, but I'm going to actively engage with your word. And actually, it's the Holy Spirit that helps these things to take root in our hearts. So I'm just simply going to say, come Holy Spirit, um, Lord God, you are the object of our affections. And where the world is regularly preaching at us and trying to shape us, in this moment, uh, we want to say, uh, actually, you have the authority to speak here. You are the focus. You're the one we're here to meet with. And we want you to speak into our hearts right now. And as we go through the simple act of reading your word, um, I pray that it would have a deep effect on us. Help us to be conscious of the places where it actually feels difficult to believe it and the gap sometimes between what your word says and how we are living. Help us to notice those things right now and to bring them before you. <clears throat> in view of God's mercy, everything has changed. So if you are in Christ, the Bible says, you are no longer a sinner, you're a saint. Romans 6 says, your old self was crucified with Christ. Would you say this? I have been crucified with Christ. You are dead to sin. Say, I am dead to sin. You can't be a little bit dead. If you're dead, you're dead. <laughs> we are dead to sin. That is radical. Say that again. I am dead to sin. 2 Corinthians 5 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Say, I am a new creation. I am a new creation. The old is gone. Say, the old has gone. The, old is gone. the new has come. Say, the new has come. The new has come. Galatians 5. It was for freedom. Say, freedom. freedom. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Say, I am free. John 8 says, who the Son sets free is free indeed. Say, I am free indeed. Romans 8 says, those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Say, I am a child of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves. Say, I am no longer a slave. The Spirit does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. Say, I have been adopted by God. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Say, I am an heir to the promises of God. Just notice, we've got more to go through, but just notice what we're doing here. I am not asking you to say anything that is just my opinion about you. I'm asking you simply to read and believe the words that God says are true about you. 1 Peter 2 says, you are a chosen people. Say, I've been chosen. Actually, it's plural. You are a chosen people. Say, we have been chosen. You're a royal priesthood. Say, we're royalty. Say, we're priests. You're a holy nation. Say, we are holy. You're God's special possession. Say, we are God's special possession. Actually, just personalize that for a moment. Say, I am God's special possession. Ephesians 1 says, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Say, I am blessed. He chose us in him before the creation of the world. Say, I've been chosen. To be holy and blameless in his sight. Say, I am holy and blameless. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is in you. Say, I am filled with resurrection power. Ephesians 2 says, God raised us up with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Say, I have been raised with Christ. And I am seated in heavenly realms. You are God's handiwork. Say, I am God's handiwork. And say this, God doesn't make bad handiworks. 
He has created you to do good works. Say, I am made to do good works. Let's go back to Romans 8. We're not done with that one. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Say, there is no condemnation. In fact, say, there is no condemnation for me. You are free from the law of sin and death. Say, I am free. I am free from the law of sin. And I am free from the power of death. In all things, we're more than conquerors. Say, I am more than a conqueror. I am convinced, Paul says. Say, I am convinced. Say, I believe your word, Lord. And I receive it by faith. I am convinced, Paul says, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm not going to make you repeat all of that. <laughs> Simply say this, nothing. Say it again, nothing. nothing. Say, I am convinced that nothing can separate me from his love. And Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word over us. I thank you for these promises so readily available. I thank you for your gospel. I thank you for the freedom that you have come to bring. And right now, we choose to receive those things by faith. And we choose to live as if your word is true. And Holy Spirit, I pray that as we worship now, would you do a work of taking those truths and getting them deep into our hearts so that as we think in our hearts, so we will become. I pray that some of those words which maybe we've read and maybe even said a million times would hit us differently. And I pray that as we start to live in the good of these things we have said and will say, may we experience healing and freedom May we increasingly see ourselves as you see us. And may we be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Come Holy Spirit.